Let's sing that together as a family. Shalom, shalom, shalom. You're my peace. You're my peace. Everybody sing. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Over me. Over me. One more time. Shalom, 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 shalom. You're my peace, yeah. You're my peace. Shalom, 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 shalom. Over me, over me. Come on, just lift your hands toward heaven. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you're showering us with your peace in this place, God. We give this moment to you fully and freely that you can have your will and your way. God, we declare that we won't leave this place the same way that we came in. We, do, we don't just give this moment to you, but our entire lives that you could have your will and your way. In Jesus' name, and the church says, amen. Before you sit down, before you sit down, tell the person next to you, peace be unto you. ABC there. Listen, I got to tell you, I'm excited. If you don't know, we've been going through this series called Hello, My Name Is, where we're exploring and revealing the names of God and what they mean to us. And so we're not doing so, so that we def these names don't define God, but they reveal parts of his character to us. And if you were with us on last week, uh, Pastor Craig went through Jehovah Shalom which means God is our peace. More specifically, it means that God is peace. And when you make the decision to fully trust in him, you will fully experience the peace that he has. This is the kind of peace that passes all understanding. This is the kind of peace that doesn't make sense to someone who doesn't have a relationship with God because this peace is not based on circumstance. This peace is based on the character and the faithfulness of God himself. This is the kind of peace that stands like a mighty fortress. It stands like a guard and a soldier guarding your heart and your mind. This is the peace that the world don't get. This is the kind of peace that when the world is on fire, you chill. Because while the world is on fire, God has everything in his hand and he's taking full care of me. It's that kind of peace. If you didn't hear that message, go back and check out that message as we talk about these names of God. So we're, but this weekend, we're talking about Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. God is my provider. But before I jump into what Jehovah Jireh means, let's talk about Jehovah, these Hebrew compound names that we're going to be studying. Jehovah, let me make this simple for you. Jehovah is the Latinized version of Yahweh. And it simply means that God is the one and only. He is the one and only. When Moses approaches, when God approaches Moses and tells him he wants to go to Pharaoh, Moses says, who shall I say sent me? And he says, I am that I am. I be who I be. I'm the one and only. Everything you need, that's me. So every time we see the name Jehovah show up in the Bible, it is God saying, I'm the one and only. I'm, I'm not one of a kind. I'm the only of my kind. I'm the one and only one that can heal you. I'm the one and only one that can save you, that can deliver you, that can give you freedom. I'm the one and the only one. Stop looking to your mother or your father or social media. I'm the only one. This is why we worship him. He's the only one. Now we jump into Jaira. Everybody say Jaira. Jaira is probably the most popular of the compound names because probably because it rhymes with provider. We hear it in songs all the time. Jehovah Jaira, my provider. Jaira means the Lord will provide, but it actually goes a little bit deeper than that. The, the word Jaira comes from a Hebrew root that means to see, to inspect, to perceive and to provide. Of all of these definitions, the one that jumped out to me the most is Jaira means to see. We serve a God that sees. I think it's, it should be comforting and encouraging to know that the God of the universe, the maker of it all, the all-powerful sovereign king, he sees you. 
He sees you when you're hurting. He sees you when your back is against the wall. He sees you when life doesn't add up. He sees you when the math ain't mathing. He sees you when things don't look right and things don't feel good. He sees you when you're crying under a pillow at night. He sees you when you can't understand how to save your children and, and get them to do the stuff that you want them to do. And he sees you when your marriage is broken and you're still trying to figure things out. He sees you. Not only does he see you, he's making a way for you. This is why we love Romans 8 and 28 that says, all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. How many things? All things. All things work together for the good, for the people who actually trust him. They wouldn't be working if he didn't see you. It's because he sees you that he's already working it out in advance. This is what Jehovah Jireh means. Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite authors, defines Jehovah Jireh as this, the God who will see to it. This is powerful because it communicates when God sees something, he's already taken care of it. Jehovah Jireh, if you get nothing out of this message at all, this is what I want you to take home, that God sees, God knows, and God provides. God sees, God knows, and God provides. Say it with me. God sees, God knows, God provides. A little bit louder. God sees, God knows, and God provides. This time, annoy your neighbor. God sees, God knows, and God provides. Whatever you're going through, remind yourself of this. When it's Wednesday and you're three days away from the message and you're like, what did I learn from that message? I learned that God sees, God knows, and God provides. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter if I can't make the ends meet. It doesn't matter what happens when I wake up at two o'clock in the morning and I'm worried about a project or my child or my marriage or a relationship. Here's what I do know. If I don't know nothing else, I know God sees, God knows, Knows and God provides. Now let's look in the Bible and let's see where does this come from? Where's the first place that we see Jehovah Jireh actually show up in Scripture? So we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 22, and it says this After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, Here I am. Let me stop here for a moment. It says, after these things. And that whenever in Scripture you see after these things, you want to know after what things. You don't want to just keep reading until you know what the things are. So let me give you a little history. We're going to back up for a second. In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham, who at the time his name is Abram, God comes to Abraham and he tells him, I want you to leave your country leave your kindred and leave your father's house and go to a place that I will show you. Some of you got happy because you think that's for you and God ain't telling you to go nowhere. <laughs> he says, I want you to leave your country. It's like the God triples down. I want you to leave your country. I want, to, I want you to leave your friends and I want you to leave your father's house. And I want you to go to a place that I will show you. God, what's the place? I'm not going to tell you right now. Just get packing and get ready to go to the place that I will show you. And then here's what God says. He says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm going to make your seed great. It will number the stars and the sand. That's how many children you're going to have. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who bless you. And I'm going to curse those who curse you. Now, Abraham at this point is 75 years old. His wife, Sarah, is 65 years old. They are past their childbearing years. They old. They old, old. <laughs> Yet God comes to them and gives them this promise that you're going to have a seed and it's going to number the stars. That's chapter 12. And then in chapter 15, God comes back to him and said, remember what I told you in chapter 12? I said that I was going to bless you, and I'm going to bless your seed. So remember what I said. So, but in chapter 16, Abraham and Sarah did something stupid. Say stupid. They did something stupid. They did something stupid like you and I would do. We heard the promise, but we got impatient. God, I heard what you said, but maybe you need my help. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. You're going to read it for yourself. You're going to go home and you're going to read it for yourself. And I know you're thinking, Pastor Dale, why don't you just tell us? It's right there in the Bible. Why don't you just tell us now? No, I'm not telling you. 
because I want to encourage you to read the Bible. But what I have to say, it is, it's reality TV worthy. <laughs> Go read it and see what stupid thing they did. Here's what I want to tell you. When God has given you a promise, wait. Wait for the promise. Don't think that you got to put your hand in it and figure it out for God. He already told you what's going to happen. Your job is to wait. Say wait. wait. So this is chapter 16. In chapter 17, God comes back to Abraham. Abraham at this point is 99 years old. Sarah is 89 years old. He says, remember what I told you. I told you that I'm going to give you a seed. Abraham hears this and he get, gets happy. Sarah hears this and she laughs. But bon chicka wong wong, nine months later, <laughs> nine months later, they have a child. His name is Isaac. Nine months later, they have a child and his name is Isaac. And this is where we pick up the story. They are a hundred years old at the time when they have this child, and Sarah is 90 years old when they have this child. Now, when we get to chapter 22, and after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am, which is the best thing that you could say when God calls you. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, let me tell you this. At this moment, Abraham is somewhere between the age of 117 and 137 years old, which means his son Isaac is somewhere between the age of 17 years old and 37 years old. Some theologians believe that Isaac is somewhere around the age of 33 years old. There are some parallels that happen in the scripture. Anybody else we know that was about 33 years old in the Bible? Okay, Jesus, I'm just gonna give that one to you for free. <laughs> so he says, I want you to take your one and only son. This has to be a tough request. He says, I want you to take your one and only son and sacrifice him on the altar, sacrifice him. Your one and only son, the one you love, the son that you held in your arms, the son that you taught him how to tie his tie, the son that you went to games with, the son that you taught how to play catch, the son that you taught him how to strap up his Jesus sandals. That son, I need you to take that one and only son of yours and I need you to sacrifice him. And in verse three, it says this. So Abraham rose early in the morning, say early. I think Abraham got up early in the morning because he didn't tell Sarah anything. Let me back up for a moment here. This story, while God has requested for Abraham to sacrifice his son, God never intends for Abraham to sacrifice his son. It is more like God is asking a question. The same question he's asking you and I today. Are you willing to give up the thing you love the most? for God who has more for you? Are you willing to give up the one for billions? Are you willing to give up the one son for what I said you're going to get? So they rose up early in the morning and he saddled his donkey and he took two young men with him and his son Isaac and he cut the wood from the burnt offering and he rose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, say the third day, on the third day, for three days they had been traveling and there's no conversation for three days. Is there anything else that's familiar that happens three days that we know about? Okay, uh, Jesus. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar off. Then Abraham said to those young men who were with him, he said, you stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. This is significant. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Abraham takes the wood and he lays it on his son. He takes the wood and he lays it on his son. Is there another story that you all can think about where some wood is laid on somebody? Oh, that's Jesus. Uh, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. 
Abraham said, here I am, my son. Essentially, this is what happened. Isaac says, hey, hey daddy, I, I see the fire and I see the wood and I know how this goes, but I don't see the lamb. And Abraham responds, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So they went, both of them. Imagine this scene for a moment. In the midst of this heart-wrenching test, Abraham makes two statements that reveal the depth of his faith and his expectation. He says, first, me and the boy will go and worship and we will return. And then he says, God will provide for himself a sacrifice. I, I, I don't know about you, but when I read this, I actually get excited. Something stirs deep inside of me because Abraham wasn't just speaking words. He was declaring an expectation of the impossible. He believed that some way, somehow, God was going to make a, where, make a way where there seemed to be no way. Abraham was expecting a miracle even when everything pointed in the opposite direction. This is the first thing that I want you to write down in your notes. Faith walks with the expectation of God's provision. Faith walks with the expectation of God's provision. Faith walks up the mountain expecting God to show up. Abraham didn't know how, but he believed that Jehovah Jireh would not fail him because true faith isn't just believing that God can provide, it's walking up the mountain fully expecting him to do so. It's this kind of faith that says, God, I don't just trust your words, I trust your character. And this is the moment where we need to pause and reflect in our own lives. How many times do we face situations that seem impossible? How often do we feel like the odds are stacked against us and, and we can't see a way out? Maybe you're in a season right now where you feel like God is asking you to give up something you love and you don't understand why. But here's what Abraham teaches us. In the face of the impossible, we must expect the miraculous. We must believe that Jehovah Jireh, the one who sees, the one who knows, and the one who provides will show up for us. And here's the deal. What you believe will not only show up in what you do, but it will also show up in what you say. He says, me and the boy will go and worship, and we're coming back. I don't know if you know how sacrificing goes, but usually something doesn't return. But before he even leaves, he declares this level of expectation, we're coming back. I don't know how, even if I slay my son, I believe that God is going to do a miracle because we're coming back. I, right now, I got an Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator spirit on me right now that says, I'll be back. I'll be back. It might look bad. I might look defeated. It might look like a desolate situation, but I'm coming back. My marriage might be broken, but we coming back. My child might not be saved, but he's coming back. Things may not look the way that I planned, but I'm coming back. I need you to say this with me. Say, I'm coming back. You need to declare these things in your life. I'm coming back. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't even matter what someone says. Declare it out of your mouth. He didn't even know what God was going to do, but he knew that God was going to do something. We coming back. In verse 9, he says, When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Did you just read that? Abraham built the altar, laid his son on the wood, and then bound his son to the altar. Some of y'all ain't getting it yet. I don't know what you know about age, but let me share something with you. If a 33-year-old man wants to whoop a 137-year-old man, he can. He can. I don't care how many vitamins you take in. 
He can whoop him and win. Isaac willingly lays down on the altar. He knows how sacrifices go. Isaac could have said, no, I'm cool, Dad. No, you lay down. No, you, I know, no, I know how this goes. No, 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 no. You got it. But he willingly lays down on the altar and then he's bound. Does this sound familiar to anybody else? Jesus willingly lays down. There's some parallels here. He willingly lays down and he's bound to the altar. He doesn't scream, he doesn't yell, but he, do you know what kind of faith you have to have in your father to allow him to lay you down and then bind you? You know what kind of ex expectation not only does Abraham have, but Isaac also has. His faith is incredible. In verse 10, it says, Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord, say angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your only son from me. Do not do anything because you have not withheld your only son from me. In the text, it says the angel of the Lord called him out from heaven. In the Old Testament, when we see the words the angel of the Lord, it's what's called a theophany. A theophany means is moments when Jesus himself actually shows up. So in this moment, what we're reading is Jesus intervenes. Because an angel does not have the authority to say what you did to me, that you withheld your son from me. It's only God himself that has the authority to say that. So Jesus Christ steps in because Jesus is the true sacrifice. Isaac would have only been a substitute. So Jesus steps in and says, you can't sacrifice your son because I'm the son to be sacrificed. I'm going to keep reading because I get excited about this. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Say, keep going, Pastor. Verse 13, it says, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. <laughs> Behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Okay. A thicket is a bush with thorns in it. The ram was caught in the thicket by his head. Y'all got it yet? So the ram represents who? Jesus. Represents Jesus. So this means before they even knew what the problem was, God had already provided a solution. We are looking at a story that is a prophecy for the future. This is a reminder that he is the Jehovah Jireh. Before we ever knew we needed him, he was setting things up already. He was already putting rams in bushes for us because he's preparing the way. This is what it means to be Jehovah Jireh. This is the second point. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Write this down, the second point. God's provision is already in motion before you see the need. It's already in motion before you see the need. Abraham, when God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, the ram was in the thicket already because God's provision is not reactive, it's proactive. Just as the ram was waiting for Abraham on the mountain, God's provision is already prepared for the challenges that you haven't even faced yet. This is the essence of Jehovah Jireh, the God who knows, who sees, and provides. It means that even when we can't see it, God is working. Even when all we can see is the struggle in front of us, God is already sending the solution. 
The ram that Abraham and Isaac couldn't see was already climbing the mountain on the other side, just like the solution to your situation is already in motion. But you got to keep going because it's there. Have you ever needed something? Maybe you needed some money. Maybe you needed a word, an encouraging word. Maybe you needed a job. Maybe you just needed a hug. And at the right moment, at the right time, the right person sends you the text message that you need, the encouraging word that you need. The right moment, at the right time, you just happen to wash a pair of jeans to have $100 in the pocket. It was like, ooh, look at what God did for me. That's Jehovah Jireh. He's preparing things for you in advance that you don't even know because God sees the big picture. You may not see the ram right now, but it's there. If you keep climbing the mountain, it's coming up the other side. Your job is to keep moving forward. And this is the verse I love in verse 14. It says, Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide or Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Abraham called it. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. God didn't come to Abraham and say, I need you to call this place after me. Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. This is your third point. Write this down. What you name your circumstances determines your outlook. Abraham could have easily called this the place of potential tragedy. He could have called it the place where all my dreams were almost shattered. But instead, he called it Jehovah Jireh. And let's dig into this for a moment. Abraham wasn't in denial about what had just happened. He wasn't trying to put a positive spin on a devastating situation. Abraham was declaring the truth about who God is. This was Abraham's but God moment. I could have lost it all but God. I could have lost my family but God. I could have lost my job but God. I did lose my job but I didn't lose my mind. I did lose my mind but I didn't lose it all but God. And all of us, if we ain't honest, we got a but God moment. And you have the opportunity to name it what you want to name it. We all have places in our lives marked by pain or loss or by things that didn't go the way we planned. But like Abraham, we have the power to name those places. We can choose to call them what they almost were or what God actually did. What is he doing in your life? About a month ago, I was in St. Louis where I grew up with my family. We're driving around in the car. And as we're driving around, I'm pointing out some landmarks and things that I remember. We passed by this hospital. And, and in the car, I said, hey, that's the hospital where I was born in. That's also the hospital where my mother worked. And I was actually surprised of the words that came out of my mouth because that's also the hospital where my mother died in. But I didn't see it as that place. I actually got excited. I got happy because I didn't, I could have called it, I could have called it, this is the place where devastation happened. This is a place where four little boys lost their mother. This is a place where a husband who had only been married for a few years lost his wife. This is a place where dreams were shattered. But I passed by that place thinking, no, this is a place where God liberated my mother from her body and he took her home to be with him, which is better than the place we're in right now. You get to name those places. Just a year ago, just a year ago, we were in a horrible car accident, me, my wife, and our youngest daughter. I'd preached on that Saturday night. My wife and I, we went out to dinner, we picked our daughter up, and as we were on our way home, the intersection that I pass by every single day, it's the only way that I get to get home. This man tried to cut us off, and he smashed right into us, totaled our car, totaled it. I have to go that way home every single day. It is the only way I can get home. I have to drive past this moment and remember what happened every day. I could, I could drive past that, that intersection and say, this is the place where I had to endure a concussion for over six months. This is the place where my wife's spine was compromised in three places. 
This is a place, and, and my wife broke her foot. This is a place where my daughter had a concussion and, and her body was compromised as well. This is, this is the place when we had the car accident, I, I could, couldn't even see for almost over 10 minutes. That's not how I see it. This, this, we were in a family car that we love. We love this car, love this family car. It was the car that you had so long, it got stains in it, you can't remember where they came from. But we love this car. I could say this is a place where we lost something that we love. But every time I drive past that place, I say, this is the place where God showed up and protected us. This is where God showed up as Jehovah Jireh. This is where God showed up as my keeper, as my deliverer. You get to name the places. And often when we're talking about God as Jehovah Jireh, we're talking about the God who shows up in the most desperate moments of our lives. The moments when we've tried everything, when we've done all that we can to fix it and it's still there is no success. But the truth is, God is always Jehovah Jireh. He's always there for you, whether we recognize it or not. He is always the God who sees, who knows and provides but we will only experience him when we fully trust in him. So my question to you now is, what is your need today? He's not just the God who meets our immediate need. He's the God who knows what we need for eternity. He loves you and he's calling you to step out in faith and to move from compliance to confidence, to move from believing that God can, but walking and talking like you know that God will. I want you to leave here today knowing God as Jehovah Jireh, knowing him as the God who sees, who knows, and who provides. I got a few scriptures I wanna to read to you before we get out of here. I want you to take this home. I want you to memorize them. I want you to write them and tattoo them on your heart. Philippians 4.19 says, and my God will supply every need. How many needs? Every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Psalm 34 and 10, the young lions suffer and want hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Matthew 6, 31 and 33, I'm just gonna read 33 here. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. How many things? All these things will be added unto you. 2 Corinthians 9 and 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all time, you may abound in every good work. And in Psalm 23 and 1, which is my, one of my favorite psalms, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. I want you to be reminded that Jehovah Jireh isn't just a name. It's a promise. It's a declaration that our God sees he knows and he provides. Say it with me, God sees, God knows, and God provides. Moment here, they're gonna sing a song, but we're gonna have our prayer partners come down here and be ready to pray for you. I don't want anybody to leave, I don't want anybody to move. We're gonna to pray together. So our prayer partners, come on down right now. I wanna encourage you to come down and get prayed for. Don't leave this place without, without getting the prayer that you need. A baby needs some prayer. Don't leave this place without getting the prayer that you need. And don't think, man, I've prayed about this over and over again. Keep praying. Be like one of those little kids that's pestering their parents. Mama, mama, mommy, mom, mommy, mom, mommy, mom, mom, mommy. What? Can I go outside? Go on. Sometimes you have to keep saying it over and over again. If you have to pee that person that says, Jesus, 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 me, Jesus. Keep talking. Sometimes it's a test of your faith. Are you willing to keep talking when you don't even hear the answer? Are you willing to keep talking when things don't go according to your plans? And sometimes you need a partner. That's why we got prayer partners coming down to pray with you. Because I, I got brothers and sometimes I wouldn't go to daddy by myself. I'm taking one of my brothers. Hey daddy, we want to know. So you need some people that can partner with you. Let's pray. 
Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless you for who you are and what you continue to do in our lives and for the person that's making a commitment right now for the first time who's surrendering their lives to you, God. We celebrate with them. God, you are a father who sees, who knows, and provides our deepest need and our deepest and our greatest need is for you. You are Jehovah Jireh. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, if you're not praying, pray for the ones who are coming down, but don't move. Let this be a moment that you allow God to speak to you and you get to speak to him as well. All right, God bless you.